So we are going to continue in our uh, series on Exodus. We've been uh, in Exodus now for many weeks, and uh, we've seen how God has um, graciously freed Israel from the oppression of Egypt. And um, they are free now. They're out of Egypt. And now the question is, what now? Like, what do we do now? Like, do we go and collect seashells by the Mediterranean Sea? Do we, um, I don't know, go fish in the Red Sea? What do we do now? What, what does the Israelites, what are they supposed to do now? And uh, the word thankfulness comes to mind, right? We all know what, is, what it is like um, when, let's say, you, know, you come to church in the morning. Maybe you're one of those that come and serve. So you may be here at like 9 in the morning. And you're like, oh, I would really like to have a warm cup of coffee on a rainy day. And then someone comes in and brings you a cup of coffee without you asking for it. You're just like, oh, I, I want to repay this person, right? Uh, you're just filled with gratitude. And, um, and something of that sort, the Israelites must have felt or should have felt because they were not just, not just a coffee mug or a coffee was given to them. They had been freed from long oppression by Egypt, and now they were free. And so the question we will be dealing with today is, how are we then to live as redeemed people, right? The life of the redeemed, how does it look like? And so we're going to uh, look at it in three points. The consecration of the redeemed, the gratitude of the redeemed, and the sanctifying trials of the redeemed. And so let's start by reading our text, which is in Exodus 13. And um, before we read God's word, let me just pray. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and that um, we can gather here together in his name. I look across this room and there are people from very different backgrounds who would usually not hang out if it wouldn't be because there's some sort of other connection than the natural one. And that connection is the Lord Jesus Christ in whom we are united as brothers and sisters. And so we praise you for Jesus and for saving, saving us through him from our sin. And so we pray that he would be lifted up today and Lord that you would help us understand your word. Be at work, we pray, through me. And through your word and through the songs and through each aspect of the service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Exodus 13, and uh, we're going to go through the whole chapter. I will first read the first section, and then we will uh, look at what it says, and then later on I will read the rest of the chapter. So Exodus 13, 1 to 16. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of men and of beast, is mine. Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today, in the month of Abib, you are going out. And when the Lord brings you out into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you. And no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. You shall tell your son on that day, It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes. And the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep the statute at its appointed time from year to year. When the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. 
Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of a man among, you, among your sons you shall redeem. And when in time to come your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of a man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes, for by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. This far the reading of God's word, and, um, and we can see here that uh, this is, again, after Israel has been freed from their oppression in Egypt, and uh, after uh, God has given some instructions on Passover, right? Exodus 12, for those of you that were here for that sermon. And now God pr proceeds to give some instructions on how their new life of liberty will look like. He institutes, first of all, the consecration of the firstborn. So that's what we're going to talk about first. The consecration, so the subtitle is, the consecration of the redeemed, right? Now, what does consecrate mean? That's a, you know, high word that you don't come across, you know, that much if you scroll through Instagram or, I don't know, TikTok, whatever people go th scroll through today. It's not exactly a word we use nowadays. What does it mean to consecrate all the firstborn? Merriam-Webster's definition of consecrate is like this, to devote irrevocably to the worship of God by a solemn ceremony. Now, the second part is, uh, I don't know if that's really applicable that much, but the first part for sure, that's it. That is what God wanted from his people. They had been undeservedly freed from oppression by their gracious Redeemer. And now they were to order their whole life around this new master, around this Savior. Their whole life was to revolve around him. And before we even go further, let me caution you about one thing that this text and that this, um, yeah, this text is not about and what it does not communicate. It is not saying here that God, that people should offer good works and sacrifices in order to gain salvation and favor of God. That is not what this is talking about. You see, spiritually speaking, this difference is essential. And it can be fatal if you don't get this. If you don't have a right understanding of the order of salvation. Ordo salutis is what uh, the theologians used to call it. Sacrifice to God, righteous living, these are things that God delights in. Yes? He wants, he wants you know, there not to be any sort of, uh, let's say, sinful actions in the world. But we must understand that these good works are a response of God's saving work in us. Unless you are part of God's people, even your best efforts will fall short of God's perfect standard and will not earn his favor. You see, you must hear the verdict of God that he says of good works done by unbelievers. This is from Isaiah 64, 6. We have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Like a polluted garment garment. The problem of humanity is not just that we are sinful, but that we cannot do anything to remedy the situation. No matter the amounts of good works, it is not enough. It is not enough to blot out our sins. And so even our good works done outside of Christ are corrupted by sin. That's the problem, our sinful heart, our prideful heart, right? Because yes, non-Christians can do good works. But that self-centered, prideful heart that loves sin is still there. And according to God's word, it is a stench to God's nostrils. If it's not done in Christ, if you're not a believer, if you've not been redeemed from all your sins and taken, and your heart of stone has been taken out and a heart of flesh has been given. You see, I mean, I know you've heard this, but uh, 
yeah, people, people divide the world in, in different kinds of people. Now, this might be a controversial statement in today's world, but the world is divided in male and female, right? That is one division. The world is also divided in, um, you know, those people that love pineapple pizza and those who absolutely abhor it. Seems like there's no in between. And if you don't, if you don't, if you're not uh, convinced by that, just come to one of our youth meetings. Every time, after, you know, we order a, a, you know, pineapple pizza and there will be those that just like absolutely love it and those that just, well, yeah, they'll give you a sermon on why it's not a pizza. But, um, but so, yeah, there's, there's a division, right? We have it even in our own minds uh, that there's, there's such a thing as male and female, pineapple pizza and non-pineapple pizza. Our, our friends in the South would divide the world between Americans and everything not Americans. And so that's just what we do. We divide the world in, in, in two, and that is right. But spiritually speaking, there's also a division. There's, there's a division. There are only two kinds of people, and that is believers and unbelievers. Those that belong to God and those who don't belong to God. Those that, whose sins have been blotted out and those who are still in their sin. And if you are an unbeliever here today, then there's only one question that really concerns you. As we are talking about good works and sacrificing for God and living a uh, consecrated life to God, this, is not, this doesn't primarily concern you. You see, if you're still dead in your sin, all your good works cannot take away that blot on your, and that, uh, yeah, that blot of sin on your heart. And so the question for you today is very simple if you are not a believer. The question is this, are your sins forgiven? Have you been born again? That is the question. That is the question for you today. No matter what you do, whether you go to the Middle East and set up a refugee camp, whether, whatever you do, you name it, it cannot blot out. It is only like this that our sins can be forgiven. If we believe in Jesus Christ and if we repent of our sins, there is only one way by which we can be saved. There's only one name given under heaven by which we can be saved, and it is Jesus Christ. And so, I invite you today to repent of your sins and to come to Christ if you've never experienced this and if you've never done this. All your good works cannot save you. But there's also an application for us as Christians. We can revert back to this mindset of work righteousness, even as believers, can we not? You know, I remember growing up, um, this is a prayer that I prayed every night, and I, I learned it, and it's, it was this. Lieber Heiland, mach mich fromm, dass ich in den Himmel komme. Amen. What that means is, uh, it was basically, like, it, it would mean like this in English. Uh, Dear Savior, forgive me of, uh, or make me righteous, that I may come into heaven. Amen. What did that, maybe that wasn't an origin, original intention of the author of the prayer, but what did it communicate to me? That I have to do good works. I have to become, I have to do righteous deeds so that I can get to heaven. And so we have these kinds of ideas still, maybe from our background, if you're from a Christian background where maybe the gospel wasn't preached clearly, and we must renew our minds, right? And we must understand that we are not just saved by grace through faith but we are also kept by grace through faith. Our good works are not just the entrance, so to speak, into God's king kingdom. Oh, sorry. The, our good works are not the entrance into God's people, and it is not what keeps us in God's people. Yes, there is a consequence. Yes, there will be a changed life, but your good works ultimately don't save you and don't keep you. It is from beginning to end the Lord Jesus Christ that saves and so we must remember that we must always renew our minds and always look to Christ, always look to Christ, because He is the one who sustains us. It is through looking to Him that we can even endure. And so may God protect us from a works-righteous attitude, even as a believer. And so going back to our text, we see that there's a concrete way this consecratedness, if that's a word, this consecratedness is supposed to show itself. And it is by dedicating the firstborn, both of animals and humans, to God. That was the principle. 
verse 15 says that it is to be done because it was through the destruction of the firstborn in Egypt, if you remember, right? Um, the firstborn of Egypt, they were all destroyed, they were all killed, and through that, Israel was let go, and Israel was saved. And so, as a memorial, they were to sacrifice their own firstborn. And they had two options to go about consecrating um, their firstborn. The first option was this, and it applied to animals, only to animals. And it was this, that they were to offer a male domesticated animal at the temple as a sacrifice to God. The firstborn of the flock, the firstborn of their herd, they were to offer. And that would, that would also sustain the, the, the priests at the temple, and so it also has a, had a purpose for that. But it was primarily just for the Israelites to realize Look, I saved you. I saved you. Your best, your very best, I deserve it, right? I deserve the very best and most precious of your flock. And, and so we see then that there is a cost to being in God's people, right? They were freed from their sins, but there is a cost attached to it. You offer your best to God. And does that not remind us of the Lord Jesus Christ when he says in... Um, Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Just a side note, Jesus did not actually teach to hate your family members, right? But the message was that Christ should be on first place in his disciples' life. Nothing should come above it even if it meant rupture with the most precious relationship you have in your life. Christ is supreme in your life if you belong to him, if you want to be his disciple. You see, if someone or something is more important to you than Jesus, then you cannot be Jesus' disciple. That was the message of Jesus here in this verse. And so Christ did not assume that just because someone knew the right words to say, that he was truly a disciple. If you remember the rich men, in, the, in, in Mark 10, he comes before Christ, right? And he says, or we read there, and, he, and as he was setting out on his journey, this is Jesus, as Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him. This is the rich man. A man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You'd be like, wow. I mean, he's a, he's a seeker. He's an inquirer. Wow. How will, how will Jesus respond? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. That's a shocking answer. And, and that's because Jesus knew what was in man's heart, right? People can say smooth things, can, say, can learn to say the right things. But are they truly God's disciples? Are they truly willing to give it all up for the Lord Jesus Christ? Jesus, being God, could see into, into that man's heart. And so we must understand that there's a cost to following Christ. And the cost is everything. It is everything. Everything you have, everything you own, you don't belong to yourself anymore. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said um, famously, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. To come and die. And so, there's a, if, even though there's a cost to following Christ, we must also never forget that there's a reward. That there is a reward. Never forget that. Yes, you are to give up everything, but you gain more than everything. You gain Christ. You gain fellowship with God. Joy inexpressible and full of glory is what Peter calls it. That is the reward. Sins forgiven forevermore, thrown into the depths of the sea. Yes, you might, you might lose family relationships. Yes, you might even lose your own life, as many did in the first two centuries and even today. In, all around the world, Christians leaving their life for their faith. And yet, you will be more rich than any earthly person here on earth, forevermore in heaven, being with your God. And so, yes, the price is great, but the reward is even greater. And so, the second option, going now back to our text, the second option that the Israelites had involves consecration by substitution. So, in verse 13, we see that the animals... Were, that weren't used for food, such as a donkey, could be redeemed with a lamb. Or, or if they were not redeemed, then they were to break its neck. And when it came to humans, the same 
uh, the same applied as in the substitution, not the breaking of the neck, the substitution applied to humans, right? They were to, they would re be, they were to be redeemed by a substitution, not sacrifice. God's people were not to be like the surrounding nations. You probably heard of stories of cultures around the world sacrificing children, sacrificing people uh, to their gods. Israel was not like that. God, God did not command that. A substitution had to be uh, given for them. And uh, even though our text doesn't say, say specifically what it is, it, it might have been an amount of money that was to be paid for the firstborn humans of each of the Israelites. Now, what's up with all these sacri sacrificial laws and the breaking of necks? And, you know, does God not like donkeys? Or why does he state that they should, you know, their necks should be broken? What is going on here? Well, the clue lies in verse 2. If you look at verse 2, it says that all of... Uh, well, I'll just read it. Let me just read it for you. Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. That is why. It is mine. It is mine. You see, without me, you would still be in Egypt. Without me, you would not have freedom. Without me, you wouldn't even have a donkey. You wouldn't even have a lamb as a substitution for the donkey. And so you owe me everything. Because because of me, you have that freedom. And so, what's going on? Uh, so, getting confused here with my notes. Um, because of me, you have everything. And so your best, your very best, um, it, you, you deserve, I deserve your very best because your very best, everything is owed, owed to me and to my gracious redeeming of you. And so there we have it then. The, the, the Israelites were to live a life of consecration to God. Everything was God's. Secondly, our second point today is the gratitude of the redeemed. And we see that in verses 3 to 10. The feast of the unleavened bread was also instituted beside the consecration of the firstborn. It was to be celebrated for seven days, and no leavened bread was to be eaten. And not even leaven itself was to be seen within the confinements of the Israelites. Every, like, there, it should not be there even. And so, um, and on the seventh day, there was actually also a, a special celebration, a special celebration should be had and should be celebrated um, just in memorial again of, of, of what God had done in Egypt to them. Now, an interesting thing to me about the Western concept of the biblical God is that it is seen as a cruel and primarily hateful God. Um, Richard Dawkins, in his book, The God Delusion, a very, very famous book, uh, he was an atheist, and, uh, and, and he says this about God. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniac, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. That was the view of Richard Dawkins. And maybe people will not um, say it like that, but many will have maybe a similar view of the God of the Old Testament as they read, as they read it. And it's like, wow, all these wars and all this. God must be um, like this. But we've been studying Exodus for... A few weeks now. Does that sound like the God of Exodus to you? Like when you read of him, of God actually giving opportunity to the Israelites or to the Egyptians before he sends the plagues and telling them, look, this is going to happen. Stop, stop. Don't continue with your evil deeds. And yet they go on. And yes, they are punished because there's a punishment for sin, a righteous punishment. But do you see God's grace and like actually extending? Like, don't do this, Egyptians, right? Why, or why would, you, why would you, you know, destroy yourself, so to speak? Or 
Um, we can also see this in, uh, in the fact that, like, you know, the, the people later on, we will see that they, the, the people of Israel were quite murmuring. They were murmuring people. Ah, oh, not again, Brad. Not again, this. Oh, where, I, will, I, I want to go back to Egypt. We're murmuring people, and yet God is gracious. God is gracious, and He forgives them over and over again. And, you know, even, even just the fact that the Israelites were for so long in Egypt, and the, and the Egyptians were not punished for their cruelness and their oppression. It's another expression of God's um, forbearance, of God's, um, yeah, just uh, merciful patience, right? And so, just a quick, quick glance at Exodus shows us that this picture that we see from Richard Dawkins is not a true picture of God. It is not what the God of the Old Testament was like. Yes, he is a just God, but no, he is not like he, just like he is described here. But more than that, we also see in our text that there is a, a day that, like defined by which they should just celebrate. The seventh day you are to celebrate. And even more explicitly, in Leviticus 23, 40, there's a whole feast dedicated to just basically rejoicing. Listen to this. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. God commands people to rejoice. That doesn't sound like the God of Richard Dawkins to me, right? And even in the New Testament, we have the term makarios, Greek term makarios, used for God in, in 1 Timothy, where Paul says, the blessed God, the blessed God. That word blessed makarios is also a word that can mean happy. So this blessed, happy God, that's what God's word says about God himself. And so we must get our idea of God from God's word and not from pop culture, right? We don't have any statement, clear statement in the Bible that God is wrath. Now, is God, is God angry at sin? Yes, we read it in God's word and God is just. But we have this clear statement in God's word. God is love. God is love. And so we must, we must have a, uh, a full picture of God, yes, but we must also understand that God is love and that primarily we must get our idea of God from God's Word and not from, um, from the pop culture. And so, yes, um, we see here then that uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is instituted and that they are to celebrate it on the seventh day. Now, or they are to have a special celebration on the seventh day. Now, the question is, why did God institute it? Again, does, not, does God not like yeast? Or why were they to put out the yeast out of the camp? And uh, we must remember, again, why this was instituted. It was instituted because um, it, God's fav God, uh, the Israelites had God's favor, right? And they had had God's favor as the Egyptians and their firstborns were killed. And now, after this plague, the Egyptians, right, were urging the Israelites, just go away. If you remember from last, last, uh, last week's sermon, just go away, Israelites. We don't even want you among us. Our firstborns are dead. What, it might happen at our own, we, we ourselves might die. Just, just go away. And so the Israelites had to pack everything very quickly and just had to run out, run out of there, uh, as it were. And they didn't even have time to let the bread rise, to put leaven into their bread. And so that was the situation. And, 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 it, and so the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a reminder of how, by, by a strong hand, the Lord, as it says in our text, by a strong hand, the Lord brought them out of Egypt. It was a reminder of God's provision, and, and again, and taking them out of Egypt. And they would need this encouragement. They would need this reminder because they would be going through trials, through a lot of trials in the, in the days of the wilderness, in the years of the wilderness. And they would need this encouragement that, wait, wait, who brought us out of Egypt? Didn't he just powerfully, by a mighty hand, bring us out? Will he not sustain us also now? And so this was supposed to be, once they were out of Egypt, to be a reminder to them of God's provision. 
Much of the spiritual health of God's people lies in this, in remembering what we already know. Not in learning new things, you know, reading systematic theology by Wayne Grudem or whatever. Yes, that's good. But much of this is just remembering what we already know. What God has done in my life. How he has come through in the past. Martin Luther said that, um, or is said to have said, that every week I preach justification by faith alone to my people because every week my people forget it. And so the basics of Christianity, so, so, so to, um, as it were, we need, to, we need to remember and we need to have them near our hearts. I, I know in my own life, much of my fight of faith um, goes like this, that, you know, I don't know, I maybe worry about something in the future, about tomorrow or about next week, whatever. And then I'm like, wait, didn't God just last week come through and show me that he's sovereign over all things and that he's guiding me? Like things I learned like in the beginning of my walk with God. And so a lot of, a lot of the spiritual health of God's people is just remembering what God has done in the past, how he has come through. And so, again, renewing our minds, right? Not to allow, I don't know, the worries and the message of the world to take away what we already know about our God and about his provision. Now, um, before we move on, we must ha highlight, highlight one last thing, and that is that God cares for the spiritual health of the generations to come. As we read, you probably saw, right, the sons are mentioned, and the fathers were supposed to tell their sons about why they were doing this, why they were breaking the donkeys, the poor donkey's neck. Why is he getting killed? And when the, when the sons would ask, he, were to, he was to explain to them about God's deliverance from Egypt, right? And so here we see and we learn that the scripture, what the scriptures repeatedly say, and that is that the parents, and mainly fathers, have a duty to teach their children about God's ways and about, um, yeah, the faith, their faith. And you might be saying, now, why is this single guy lecturing me on how to, you know, disciple my, my kids? What does he know? And yeah, you're right. I don't know. And I don't have experience. But listen to God's word, right? Don't listen to me. Listen to God's word, what he says in Ephesians 6, 4. He says this, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So don't listen to single Marcos, listen to God's eternal word. It's God's command. It is the, 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 yeah, the command for the parents and for the fathers to do this. Jonathan Edwards, the great saint in the 18th century, said this about family worship. Every Christian family ought to be, as it were, a little church, consecrated to Christ and wholly influenced and governed by his rules. And family education and order are some of the chief means of grace. So fathers, parents, is the aroma of Christ felt and smelled in your room, is, in your house? Is God's word being taught to your children? And you must understand that this labor in disciplining your children is not in vain. A.E. Winship, which who was an American educator, Trace the descendant, to descendants of Edwards, of whom we just read this quote. He traced the descendants of Edwards almost 150 years after his death. And he found out that in his family tree, right, this man, this godly man who sought to, you know, pass, out, pass down his faith to his children, they found the, these people and these descendants among his family tree. One U.S. vice president... 13 college presidents, 100 lawyers, and 300 preachers. All just from this one godly family, Jonathan and, Edward, uh, Jonathan and Sarah Edwards. Now, they did another study of the descendants of another man who was known for being a drunkard and, from what we can gather, not a Christian at all. And uh, he lived at the same time as Jonathan Edwards. And they found this about him, that in his family tree, there were this, in, 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 among his descendants included seven murders, mur murderers, 60 thieves, 190 prostitutes, 150 other convicts. What a legacy. What a legacy. You see, parents, your investment in your children matters. 
Truly, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And even in our midst, we have an example of this. David Jaleff was telling me about how, just last week, he was telling me about how he was brought up um, in a Christian home and how he would sometimes hear um, at night his parents praying for him. Like they would, they, their bedroom would be above, and he would like sometimes hear like in the middle of the night just prayers being poured out for him through the floorboards. And he just mentioned how that affected him. And how he did not just learn about the importance of prayer, but he saw it exemplified in his parents. And now we can see even his own children, right, serving faithfully in the church. And so we have an example of that even just amongst us. And I know many of you also um, have the same kind of legacy. So praise God to that, and may God help you to be faithful in, in raising and bringing up your children, bringing them up in the fear of the Lord. This is a great blessing that God honors. A great uh, is a, a, a something that God honors. God honors faithfulness in this area. And so, so we re- learn here then that God's people are supposed to also be thankful, right? And that they are supposed to, um, yeah, praise God, praise God f- from, with a thankful heart for what He has done in their lives. Now. Lastly, we have, in our third point, the sanctifying trials of the redeemed. Now, um, before we, we, we talk more about this, let me just read our, our text, which is Exodus 13, 17 to 22, and then uh, we will uh, look at a few things in this. So it says here in uh, Exodus 13, 17 to 22, When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made his sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Sukkoth and encamped at Etham, on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, and that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. So when you think of God's guidance, what is the first thought that comes to mind? God guiding his people. I think usually we think of something like like someone that might be looking up on Google Maps, a church nearby, and he finds Westland Baptist Church. And then he comes to church. Casey and the other greeters greet him kindly. And he just, wow, look at the love in this place. And then he hears the gospel preached. And then he becomes a believer, and then everything is happy and everything is good and all is well. God guided that man here. Does he guide like that? Yes, he does. Amen. Or maybe someone thinks that, you know, a Christian from the eastern part of Canada and another Christian, like a Christian guy and a Christian girl, they just meet at a Christian conference and, you know, they fall in love and they get married and they have a family and they live happily ever after. God guided them to be together, right? Does does God guide in those ways? Yes. But here we have the guiding hand of God in a more darker way, in a more darker providence. Um, Israel is out of slavery. They are free. The promised land is in their grasps. It would only take them about two weeks if they would take the Via Maris, which is the shortest way, the coastal highway, to get to Canaan the promised land. Two weeks, that's it. Now, the problem was that there were Philistines in the area, and the Israelites were not ready for war. They were not ready for war. And God knew this. God knew this. Maybe to the minds of the Israelites, that was the shortest and most direct way to get to the promised land, right? Two weeks, and that's it. 
but God knows better. And so instead of leading them by the most logical, direct, and shortest way, he leads them by way of the wilderness. That is what our text explicitly says, right? He leads them into the wilderness or to the wilderness. And so instead of only taking two weeks, they would arrive in the promised land in 40 years. And God led them. God led them. It was God's leading. It was not Satan doing it. It was God's providential hand leading them in this. And so we learn here that God personally led his people through trials for a period of 40 years to mature them and to make them ready for the promised land. And I know naturally some of you are thinking, and it brings up the question of evil in your mind, right? Like many people stumble over this. Like who's ultimately in control over evil, right? Pointed questions like these must be answered. Is God in control of a death of a child in a car accident caused by a drunk driver? Is God in control? Who is in control of plagues such as the Black Plague in the, in the uh, Middle Ages, where around 50% of Europeans died? Who is in control of that? Ultimately, ultimately in control. Or someone might ask, where was God when my, when my mother died, when I was 10, right? What do, what do we, how do we answer these kinds of questions? These are heavy questions, and I know that many of you have. Is Satan ultimately the one in control of this? So, Satan ultimately sover, sovereign? Is it all just random acts? So this leads us to two truths. Two truths. Sorry, truth. Um, the sovereign plan of God is the first one. So, God is sovereign over history. God has a plan, and no one can thwart it. I mean, you read the Bible, and you just can't escape that truth. You just can't escape it. Like, from Genesis to Revelation, God is God, we are not God. Jesus is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. No one can stay God's hand when he wants to do something. Where is their God? Our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. That is the message of God's word. God is sovereign and in control. From the setting up and taking down of kings, Daniel 2, to the relatively insignificant falling of a bird in some South American jungle, God is in control. That is the message of God's word. So God not Satan, is in control of every minute detail that happens in this world. And in our text, it is ultimately not Moses, but God, God himself, that leads his people into the wilderness. Now, God's sovereignty would be bad news if he were, not, if he were just sovereign. Can you imagine someone like Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin being all-powerful? That's not good news. That's not good news. But here we have the second truth. And that is that God is not just sovereign, but that he is good. That he is good. See, in, in, my, in my room, I have uh, two poems by William Blake. One is called The Lamb, and one is called The Tiger. And uh, what William Blake basically does is he, um, through describing the lamb, shows God's care and God's uh, how, how it shows us God's attribute of care and love. Whereas by describing the fierceness and the, just you could call it like the earthly glory of a tiger with his patterns and his strength, he shows this other side of God, his, his sovereign side, his um, glorious side beyond ourselves, right? That we are not like God. We are not like that. And it beautifully captures this, these two sides, so to speak, as it were, these two clusters of attributes of God where he is not just sovereign, but he's also good. And he is near to his people. And we see it in our text. Um, we see it that uh, God cares for his people in verse 17, right? And, and he wants the best for them. He knows that they are not ready to fight the Philistines yet, even though the Israelites might think otherwise. It's like, yeah, we're ready. We're ready. In just two weeks, we're there. God knows better. God knows better. And his caring, you know, his caring attribute, his love, draws him to, to not do that and to lead him into a different way. 
And his care is further emphasized in verses 21 to 22. A pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And God was in them, it says in verse 21a. God was in them. God's presence went with them wherever they were. And he guided them in a spectacular way. And people might say, oh, if only God could lead me today like that. If only God could lead me today like that. But we must understand the reality of the Holy Spirit in us. God is not just leading us today from the outside, as it were, through a cloud. But God is living in you. If you are a believer, if you belong to Christ, if you have been redeemed of your sin, you are the temples of the Holy Spirit. God dwells in, in you, and He will lead you into all truth, and He will guide you, and He will comfort you. The glories of the new covenant. That's what it is. The glories of the new covenant. And so, yes... We are guided by God in an even more spectacular way. We are guided by Him personally as He is in us through the Holy Spirit, guiding us day by day as we are re being renewed, as we learn more about God's Word, as we speak to other more mature believers, as we grow in our faith, the Holy Spirit is guiding us. He is guiding us. And praise God for that. And that His plan is good, right? That He is not just sovereign, but that He is also good. And so when a tragedy happens in your life, Let's say the death of a child or the loss of a job or hard, hardships in marriage, right? Where, it is, where is it that you go for comfort? Or what is comforting to you? Is it comforting to you that to know that the devil is ultimately in control? That he is the one who's guiding this? Is that comforting? Or that everything is at random? Is that, is that comforting? Or are you able to say with Job that both good and bad come from God's hand? Now, you must be clear, this does not mean that God delights in punishing people or, or sorry, that he delights in making people just unnecessarily suffer, that seeing his people groan, you know, under hardship. No, no, he wants the best for them. But you all know, you all know we learn much better under the rod of affliction than in the peaceful oasis of, uh, you know, good time. How many things have you not learned? And I've talked to quite a few of you. How many of you have not learned lessons in hardship that you would not have learned in any other way? God knows it. God knows it. And so even though it might feel like it's not, um, you know, the best way, it is the best, best way. God's ways are always the best ways. Even though it might seem like the long way, like the 40-year way. Why 40 years? Why not two weeks? Well, because you needed those 40 years. You needed those 40 years. It is preparing you. It is maturing you for either what will God use you in the future or just for the promised land. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Holiness is necessary in order to enter God's uh, kingdom. And now we know holiness ultimately comes from believing in Christ and having all our sins forgiven. But the Christian life is a, is a, is a, is a sanctification Life. It's a life of where we are getting uh, to be more and more like Christ. And God uses trials to that end. And so um, I, I like what Han Ma Matthew Henry, the commentator, writes about uh, this passage. He says, If we think he leads not his people the nearest way, yet we may be sure he leads them the best way. And so it will appear when we come to our journey's end. So it will appear when we come to our journey's end. Right now, you might not see it. And it takes faith. In the midst of a dark providence, it takes faith to just be like, God is good. Will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? God is good. He is still good. He is still, he is doing me no, no evil. And so faith is necessary in order to talk like that. Like no one talks naturally. Like no one wants to suffer. Like who wants to suffer here? Like, hey, yeah, let's go and, I don't know, get trampled over by a car or something. No, no one wants that. It's not natural in us. And so it takes faith. And we see that in verse 19. In verse 19, we see the need for faith in God. Um, it's, a bit, it's a rather confusing passage. Like Why I suddenly to talk about, like, you know, bones and, and, and this. And we must understand that the, the ancient Israelites believed in life after death as God's people. They believed that there was a life after death and that it was an honor to be buried together in a common grave with family. 
And Acts 7, 15 to 16 tells us that the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they were buried, buried in Canaan, in the promised land. That's where they were buried. In light of this, Joseph's commands to his brothers becomes enlightening. Like we're, we're talking here now about Genesis 50, right? Joseph, um, he believed God's promise that God would lead his people, he didn't know when, but in the future, into the promised land. Into the promised land. So he commands his, his brothers to take his bones to the promised land when the is meant to the promised land when the Israelites reached the promised land. Right? If you go out the you can look at it later. Genesis, oh, maybe it's there. Yeah, maybe it's there. Uh, Genesis 50, 24 to 25, right? You can see there that he doesn't say if they reach the promised land, but when they reach the promised land. Joseph was confident in God's promise that the sons of Abraham would have a land, would have the promised land. And so he did not just see it with his physical eyes, obviously. He couldn't see it like he was going to die and it would happen like later on and, and he would have dead, been dead by then. But he believed that God would be true to his promises, even though he couldn't see it with his eyes. And there's a lesson here for us and we're rounding off now. But you must understand, believer, and you must take hold of this by faith that when you are in the middle of the valley of shadow of death, right? And it takes, and it takes faith and it takes sometimes even in the midst of your tears, right? Just tears rolling down, but just say, no, God is good and God is sovereign. No, God is good and God is sovereign. No one can snatch me out of the Father's hand. He is good. He has said that he will work all things together for my good. Even if it means 40 years in the wilderness, God is good to me. We must preach to ourselves like that. It doesn't come natural. It does not come natural. And this, 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 this passage teaches us to, to preach to ourselves like that, just like the psalmist did, preached to himself and said, why are you downcast? Why are you downcast within me? Hope in God, right? We need to do that often. We need to rile, our, rile ourselves up and tell ourselves what we already know, what we already know, and we might have forgotten. We might have forgotten. And so, um, may God grant us faith. May God grant us faith and not unbelief in God's promise that he will do us good, that he is not just sovereign, but he is also good, and everything he does is for my good. And may we learn to pray with the Puritans. Um, one of the Puritan prayers goes like this. I often mourn the absence of my beloved Lord, whose smile makes earth a paradise, whose voice is sweetest music, whose presence gives all grace and strength. Even in the midst of the wilderness, this can be a reality. Right? whose presence gives all grace and strength. But, he says, this prayer says, but by unbelief, I often keep him outside my door. Let faith give entrance that he may abide with me forever. We must have faith. We must have faith. We must not allow our feelings um, or the voice of the enemy or anything else to disturb us from what God has said and from what, of what God has promised. And so in the midst of your perplexed perplexing trials, trust him. And so the redeemed can be faithful and even joyful in the midst of trials because their redeemer is not just sovereign, but he's also good. And above all, you must look to Jesus Christ. You must look to him who was led into a wilderness that was way more dark than anyone will ever experience. If you remember him in the Garden of Gethsemane, submitting to God's will in the midst of that dark trial that was awaiting for him, right? That dark wilderness on the cross. And even on the cross, commending his spirit into the Father's hand, right? Being faithful there in the wilderness. See him in the wilderness of Golgotha on the cross, being obedient even unto death. Why? To redeem his people from their slavery to sin. Just like God, and as we've heard from Sam uh, last week, how, just like God and Exodus in Egypt is a pointer towards how we are free from our sin, so that could only happen through Christ, who was led into the wilderness of the cross and who died for the sins of his people and who redeemed his people. And now his people can live a joyful and faith-filled life. Through this great evil, right, this great evil of killing the Son of God, 
which you could argue is the greatest evil ever committed. Through this great evil and this great bad thing, the most good event, the greatest good that has ever come happened, which is the redemption of God's people. And so God, even on the cross, used in his sovereignty the evil of killing the Son of God for the salvation of his people. And so praise God for that. And may we always and constantly um, think and meditate on Jesus Christ and how he led us out of the Egypt, out of the spiritual Egypt of our sin. And let us live lives that are consecrated to him. Let us live thankful lives. And let us live lives trusting in our Savior that he will grant us entrance into the promised land, even if we have to go for 40 years through the wilderness. He is faithful. He will never leave us nor forsake us. So praise God for that. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It never changes. It never grows old. It never loses its power. And so we pray, Lord, that even today you would be at work in um, sanctifying us and in, in through your word. And Lord, that those that don't yet belong to you would be convicted of their sin. Father, help us to live faithful lives. Oh, we need the Spirit of God uh, in us to live these kinds of lives that we, that we read in the scriptures that we should live. And so we pray that you would help us, Lord, in our weakness, in our stumblings. Help us to, be, to look more and more steadfast to you and to live thankful in lives that matter, that truly matter, where people would say after we pass away that there's a lack now in the world. There is now a lack in the people of God because they were busy doing God's will and, and, and spreading God's kingdom. And so help us, Lord. Help us to be these kinds of redeemed people. And we thank you that you have said that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And that is our confidence, that you are with us, that your presence goes with us through the Holy Spirit wherever we go. So we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.